Hey everyone, and welcome to this video. As the next generation of consoles such as the PlayStation 5 and Xbox Series X approaches, the last couple of exclusive titles are making their way to current gen platforms. Sony in particular have had a ridiculously successful generation in terms of cultivating their first party studios, and their output in regards to publishing quality single player experiences is unmatched. With God of War, Marvel's Spider-Man, Horizon Zero Dawn, and The Last of Us Part II all standing out as high quality, memorable games that have helped to really cement the PlayStation brand as a place for great experiences worth purchasing a console for. That success is further cemented by the topic of this video, the final AAA release published by Sony for the PlayStation 4 and considered by many to be the swan song for this generation of Sony consoles, Ghost of Tsushima. Join me as I go in depth with the game and discuss my thoughts and feelings towards it, and why I think it perfectly epitomises this generation of consoles, both in terms of open world single player game design, as well as the general overall quality in terms of storytelling and visual fidelity, as well as aesthetic cool design. I think I've rambled on long enough though, so without any further ado, here's my in depth review of Sucker Punch Studios latest game, Ghost of Tsushima. Ghost of Tsushima is an open-world action-adventure game developed by Sucker Punch Studios. It was unveiled at E3 2017 and released in July 2020. The game is set on the Japanese island of Tsushima during the 13th century and focuses on Jin Sakai, one of the few surviving samurai on the island, and his journey from an honourable samurai into the benevolent ghost in order to repel a Mongol invasion threatening to consume all of Japan. On release, it was met with overwhelming critical and commercial success, with critics praising its gameplay, graphics and story, yet criticising the open world for being too formulaic. Player reaction has also been very positive with lots of people falling in love with the game's unique aesthetic, lovable characters and incredible world. As of writing this video, it has been publicly revealed that Ghost of Tsushima sold 2.4 million copies within its first three days of release worldwide, making it the fastest selling original game published by Sony this generation. As someone who personally isn't the biggest fan of formulaic open world adventure games, I was admittedly a bit apprehensive going into the game, but as you'll soon discover, I fell in love with the game from the moment I started it, and that feeling only grew as I played more and more of the game. For the purposes of this review, I played it on PlayStation 4 Pro, taking full advantages of the benefits of the platform. In terms of how much of the game I played, I played it to the very end with full story and trophy completion, meaning I finished the story as well as all side quests and any open world collectibles that fell under trophy requirements though not to full 100% completion, as by the time I finished all the content I really didn't feel up to scavenging the entire island for the last few records, Mongol artifacts, crickets or banners I needed for full completion. Good form, Jin. You're improving. Need to catch your breath? <laughs> It'll take more than a child to knock the wind out of me. Now then. The game tells the story of Jin Sakai, one of the last surviving samurai on the island, and his fight against the Mongol horde invading Tsushima, as well as his internal conflict with breaking his samurai code of honour by becoming the ghost in order to be able to outwit and stop them. The opening of the game is an incredibly cinematic showpiece that quickly gets you introduced to the main characters, such as Jin and his uncle, Lord Shimura, 
as well as establishing just how much of a threat the Mongols are, with how quickly and efficiently they decimate the samurai on the island through taking advantage of their code of honour. The aftermath of the Battle of Komoda Beach showcases the horrors of the Mongol army as they butcher everyone in a nearby village as a defenseless jinn sneaks around to escape, also getting the player used to the stealth mechanics in the game. The final section of the opening introduces you to the dual boss fights with a climactic fight against Koten Khan, the leader of the Mongol army, though since we're only about 30-40 minutes into the game at this point, Jin has no chance and cannot defeat him yet, and thus gets cast off the bridge of his uncle's castle. Thankfully, Jin manages to survive the fall and decides he needs to recruit more allies if he wants to stand a chance against the Mongol horde, so he sets off on his journey to find people who will help him in his cause. The opening to the game stands as one of the best introductions to a video game I've played in a long time, through its use of music and excellent cinematography during cutscenes, to the superb way it introduces the player to the gameplay, before letting them loose on this huge expansive world. I had literal goosebumps when the title card appeared as Jin raced across a field of flowers on his horse, as the music swelled to a crescendo. Now altogether it's some real powerful stuff. The side quests in the game intertwine with the narrative quite well, with the core side quests branching off from the main story into full quest chains focusing on the different allies Jin makes during his travels to help liberate Tsushima. One chain follows Lady Masako Adachi, the matriarch of Clan Adachi, whose family has been massacred, and she needs Jin's help to hunt down the culprits. Then there is the tale of Sensei Ishikawa, a master bowman whose apprentice has gone missing. Norio is a young monk you encounter on arriving in the second area, who is trying to live up to his brother's legacy. Kenji is a sake brewer who keeps getting himself into messes that Jin needs to rescue him from, and finally Yuna is a thief who is integral to Jin's transformation into the ghost, but also has a dark and tragic past that gets explored during a short side quest chain. These side quest chains are all good, and each tell their own small storyline that helps to flesh out some of the side characters, whilst also showing their flaws as people, and they all perfectly accompany the tone and narrative structure of the central main story pretty well, and are great companion pieces when you're bored of the main story. One thing to note about these chains is that you can't complete all of them right at the start of the game, as some of the chains, such as Norio's, only become accessible after reaching the second area, and some have quests across the entire island meaning most of the chains won't be completable until reaching the final act of the game's story. This is in my opinion good because it stops the player from rushing through each chain and allows the quests to better flow alongside the main story. I definitely encourage completing as much of a quest chain as you can before continuing the story, so that you're progressing both at the same time. Don't leave the side story chains to the end, as some of them are quite long and you might find yourself getting a bit bored by the end of them, if you do them all in one sitting that is. There are also smaller individual side quests that see Jin solving people's problems around Tsushima. These are alright for the most part, with most of them being entertaining short stories, such as this one where Jin has to investigate a forest allegedly inhabited by vengeful samurai spirits where anyone who enters never returns. Though at the same time, whilst none of the quests are bad per se, there are quite a few forgettable ones, which I suppose is expected considering just how many side quests are in the game. Thankfully, none of these quests are very long, either, and usually only last about 5 to 10 minutes, so even the dullest quests in the game are over before they become too much of a hassle. There are also mythic tales, which are supernatural themed quests presented like Japanese folklore stories, with really cool openings where a wandering musician tells you the tale of an ancient warrior, whilst hand painted images of the tale are shown in the background. These tales usually reward you with legendary gear or special abilities themed around that quest, such as the ability to set your sword on fire. These are some of the best side quests in my opinion, and while there are only a few of them, the rewards for all of them are useful, 
and the quests themselves are really cool and have some of the more interesting and unique objectives in the game, such as one where you have to find a location on the map based on a painting, or the one where you have to light fires as you climb a tall mountain to prevent freezing to death. The Mythic Tales are definitely a nice change of pace from the rest of the game, and the rewards for all of them are really useful. Though, from my experience I've found that the ability rewards are so good that for the most part they make the difficulty in boss fights trivial, even on the hardest settings. So if you're someone who likes a challenge, it's probably best to keep that in mind and save the mythic tales that reward you with abilities for after you complete the main story. Regarding the quality of the main story itself though, it's honestly really damn good, and pretty consistent throughout. The story focuses on Jin's attempts to liberate Tsushima from the Mongols, realising that to do so he must forsake his samurai code and adopt less honourable fighting tactics, such as assassination to take the Mongols by surprise and outwit them. The story has two key story threads, the first is obviously liberating the island of Tsushima from the Mongols and killing Khotun Khan. The second is Jin's gradual transformation into the ghost, and the conflict this causes both internally and with the relationship between Jin and his uncle, Lord Shimura, the lord of the island and a samurai zealot who sees Jin's actions as the ghost as dishonourable. Admittedly, if you're looking for a unique story that has never been told before, you're probably not going to find that with Ghost of Tsushima as it wears its samurai cinema influences like a badge of honour, and thus the narrative features a lot of tropes and story beats common in those types of films. But, despite that, it must be said that the story is told phenomenally well, with excellent cinematography during cutscenes that emphasises the emotional weight of certain scenes perfectly. The opening of the game, as I mentioned earlier, is a testament to that, but the story doesn't diminish in quality at all throughout the game, with other key highlights in my opinion being the finale to Act 2, as well as the ending of the game in general. Though I won't show them in this video, because honestly it's something you've really got to experience yourself to really appreciate. All in all, Ghost of Tsushima really excels when it comes to its storytelling, whether through the incredibly intense cinematic cutscenes in the main story, the more personal and emotionally driven side story chains, or the lore-driven mythic tales. Whilst parts of the story rely a little too much on cliché tropes, I didn't find it impacting my opinion of the story that much, just because of how well it was all being told. The gameplay in Ghost of Tsushima is where the game truly shines brightest, with tons of different ways to approach each objective making every encounter feel at least a little bit unique and keeping the game from getting stale. There is a deceptive amount of depth to gameplay and every encounter feels different due to the various different ways you can approach them. Do you go in sword in hand and single-handedly slice through every mongol in your path, utilising Jin's various different stances and abilities to their full potential, or do you go in stealthily, picking enemies off one by one, using every trick in the book to neutralise the threat before it even realises you're there? Or maybe you just like to survey from the distance with a bow in hand and use objects such as hornet nests, barrels and torches to vanquish your foes for you. There are many ways to fight in Ghost of Tsushima, and every one of them is satisfying and fun to master. I never got bored with the combat in the game through my time playing it. In terms of how the samurai style fights go, at the start of battle you can initiate a standoff, where you and an enemy, or multiple after unlocking upgrades, face one another in combat. The way standoffs work is that you hold the triangle button until they decide to attack, and before the attack hits, you release Triangle to counter and instantly kill the foe. After that, the battle properly starts and everything gets a lot more hectic. Jin can use light attacks to deal quick damage to enemies, or slow heavy attacks to break down their defences. He can also dodge and block attacks to prevent getting hurt, or even parrying by blocking at the right time to leave the enemies open for attacks. 
Over the course of the game you'll grow a lot more accustomed to how the combat works and you'll eventually figure out how each enemy type functions and how to appropriately deal with them, especially once you upgrade more and more of your combat related abilities, such as learning how to parry attacks that you could only dodge before, or different combos that help to break down an enemy's defense. One thing to keep in mind at all times during combat is Jin's resolve gauge, which is essentially a stamina bar that can be used to replenish health in combat or to use abilities, so deciding whether to prioritize attacking or healing is important for success in combat, especially in the early game when you have little resolve and fewer ways to restore it. You can restore resolve by parrying enemy attacks, though later on you can unlock upgrades that allow you to restore resolve in other ways during combat. Early in the game, Jin starts his journey towards becoming the Ghost of Tsushima, breaking his Samurai Code of Honor by learning and using his abilities and skills that help him sneak around and assassinate enemies one by one without alerting the rest. These skills are mostly only going to be used for clearing out Mongol encampments, due to the size of the army occupied there usually making it more difficult to survive otherwise. Stealth is especially important if they have prisoners that they'll try to execute at the first sign of trouble as well. The reason you probably wouldn't want to use assassinating outside of those sections though is just because for most of the game, at least in my opinion, the samurai way of fighting is a lot more interesting, and just in general looks a lot cooler to pull off well. As Jin's legend grows, he'll gain access to a larger tool set of items that make his work as the ghost much easier such as the kunai that can stun enemies and sometimes even kill, or the smoke bomb allowing for a quick retreat when needed. Both playstyles work very well together, and I've often found a combination of the two is the best way to play the game. For example, sneaking into an enemy encampment and fit killing off as many as I can, before confronting the survivors samurai style to finish them off. Halfway through the game, you unlock a special stance called the Ghost Stance that you can activate after killing 10 people without getting injured. When in the Ghost Stance, you can instantly kill up to 3 enemies regardless of their health or defense. I found it's quite a useful stance to use at the end or the beginning of a long battle, or to get rid of some of the tougher enemies in a group without effort, and it just looks incredible to use. So you want to use it whenever you get it, especially since you'll lose it if you get hit. The game has several difficulty options, easy, medium and hard, with the latter being the one I played the game through. Hard difficulty is very challenging, at least initially, before you get access to more abilities and more combat options, and before you've collected a lot more of the collectibles that boost your health and resolve. But as you go through the game and you get more accustomed to the control scheme, you'll find it's still difficult, yet almost second nature to you, and it's very satisfying when you reach that point. There are several different ways to upgrade Jin and his abilities over the course of the game. The first is by unlocking extra abilities and developing new stances, some of which are unlocked by building your legend by completing objectives in the open world and earning technique points which you can then use to upgrade your skills, or by simply progressing through the story and side content. Over the course of the game, as you unlock new abilities and upgrades, it does feel like Jin transforms from a lone samurai into a one-man army. I also found the enemy variety in the game to surprisingly be one of its strongest points. Going in, I expected the enemies in the game to consist of fairly boring generic Mongol grunts, but while you do face off against Mongols primarily, there's a ton of different types of Mongol infantry to face, each requiring different parry and dodge timings, as well as making you change sword stances regularly, as each stance is more useful against certain types of enemies than others. To give more clarity on the amount of enemy variety in the game, you have the Mongols, but within the Mongol ranks you've also got about 6 main types of Mongol, swordsmen, shield bearers, spearmen, archers, grenadiers. Then you've got the larger Mongol enemies, which are they themselves divided into shield bearers, spearmen or axemen. On top of that, you also have different skill levels of Mongol troops, identified mostly by the colour of their clothing that have tighter parry and dodging times, as well as more health and are harder to stagger. Then you've got the various types of Mongol leaders as well, that mostly comprise of more armoured variations of the regular troops, with slight variations to their movesets to make them more unpredictable. 
Outside of the Mongols, you've also got Japanese bandits, which are similar to the Mongols in terms of weapon variety, but are a lot easier to deal with, as well as wild animals such as bears and boars and dogs, which again aren't too difficult to take out, though the dogs in particular could be quite annoying when fighting the Mongols, as they can stun you and leave you very open to attacks. You also have the Straw Hat Ronin, who fight very similarly to Jin's own samurai fighting style, and as such can be a pain to deal with when there are more than one of them, the fighting them always leads to some cool looking fights. These enemy designs aren't just cosmetic either, all of them have different parry attack and dodge timings, as well as unique attacks in general that make them all feel fresh and unique, regardless of when in the game you actually fight them. Boss fights in the game take on the form of duels, one-on-one -on -one fights of honour that share the same general cinematic intro, where the two fighters stare each other down and slowly draw their weapons. The fights themselves are fairly similar in terms of gameplay to the regular samurai combat, only one-on-one, -on -one, where you'll be changing your stance to match the enemy's weapon type, then blocking, parrying and dodging at the right timing. Bosses differ from regular fights since bosses have several phases where their combos evolve and become slightly more complex as they take more damage, leading to moments where you think you've got the boss's attack pattern down until they knock you back down with a new attack you didn't see coming. These fights also have a slightly different camera angle than regular fights, instead keeping close and over Jin's shoulder, so you're always staring the boss down head on making the fight feel both more cinematic and easier to deal with when it comes to control. The combat in Ghost of Tsushima is easily its highlight and it feels satisfying and fulfilling to defeat enemies regardless of how you do it, whether by picking them off one at a time by bow or through assassination, or by facing a horde of mongols head on with your katana in hand. I played the game to full completion and because of the huge amount of enemy and gameplay variety, as well as the overall quality and fun of it all, I never got bored with combat once, which I think is the best thing I could possibly say about it. It's probably the most satisfying game I've played so far this year in that regard. Aside from combat, there are the standard traversal systems most open world games feature, such as riding on horseback, climbing up mountains and basic platforming. All of these work as intended for the most part, though I can't really say there is anything particularly outstanding gameplay wise outside of combat. It's just solid but standard open world traversal fare. The island of Tsushima is breathtaking, with each area having a unique landscape and general aesthetic. The first area, Izahara, is covered in forests, some with golden trees, such as the woods near the Golden Temple, some with white petal trees, and some just normal green trees, as well as several fields of flowers of different types. In terms of appearance, Izahara is probably the one that feels the most visually captivating and varied across the entire landmass of the area. The next area, Toyotama, is mostly covered in bamboo trees and marshes to the south of the island, with autumnal looking forests to the north of the area. This area is probably my personal least favourite area in terms of beauty, but that's not to say it looks awful, far from it. It's just the other two areas look much more aesthetically pleasing to my personal tastes. The final area, Kamiyagata, is almost completely covered in snow, with most of the trees in the area barren due to the cold climate. There are also a plethora of fields of flowers similar to the ones found in Izahara, which prevents the area from looking like a complete wasteland. A good portion of the forests in Kamiyagata are also completely burnt down, with the surrounding area also sharing the same fate, which thematically helps to show the ruthlessness of the Mongol horde, yet at the same time creating a striking and emotional impact aesthetically due to the uniqueness of the biome. Seeing the burnt wasteland make way for a beautiful snowy tundra really helps to drive home how much Tsushima has been hurt by the invading forces. Each area of Tsushima looks incredible, and is consistent to the game's overall art style, in the sense that everything feels like it belongs in the world, especially when you find yourself atop a mountain and look down at it all from a distance. It all looks spectacular. The character models and animations are also quite amazing both in cutscenes and during gameplay, with an immense amount of detail on the armour and outfits the characters wear. 
you can almost see every little intricacy in the weave of the samurai armor, for example. The facial animations during both pre-rendered and in-game cutscenes are also quite great at effectively conveying the character's emotion in a way that feels natural. Animation quality also transitions well into gameplay, with animations fluidly chaining together during combat, which helps to make the combat in the game look cool and dramatic. In terms of which graphical effects in particular stand out the most, I'd say the most impressive is probably the weather and particle effects encountered throughout the world. In particular the way the wind blows leaves and other small particles out of your path as you walk by, as you can see in this footage of Jin walking through the Golden Temple area. It all just looks really quite incredible, and complements the game's unique style and aesthetic perfectly, giving it an almost otherworldly beauty and dramatic charm to it if that makes sense. The terrain itself also looks incredible, with all the flowers, blades of grass, and foliage in particular looking phenomenal, especially since it all reacts naturally to the characters, the wind, and the weather, helping to immerse the player in the world better. Not all of the terrain looks amazing, however, with some of the ground textures as well as some of the rock textures being noticeably so far. One complaint I did have, at least with the display I was using, was that at times the black levels in the game made nighttime scenes too dark to see anything clearly, so I had to alter the brightness settings constantly during the opening hours of the game until I got it to a setting where I could get used to it. Though admittedly, I think that might just have been my display since my capture card recording looked perfectly fine when I rewatched the footage of it back. So, who knows? Whilst we're on the topic of displays, the game also features HDR implementation, though my display doesn't support it so I couldn't test it myself. But from what I've heard from those who do have a display that supports HDR, the added depth to the colour makes the game look even more beautiful, so I'm quite envious of them. I can definitely see why HDR would be a huge benefit for this game, as one of the key parts of its aesthetic is its use of colour throughout the entire island. The game also has one of the best photo modes I've ever seen in any video game. By pressing right on the D-pad at any time during gameplay, the game freezes and an overlay appears featuring an assortment of different options that help you to get the perfect photo. Whether it's dynamically changing the time of day or weather, to adding and changing the density of particles or the direction of the wind in the scene. You can also alter the depth of field and even what expressions Jin is making. There's a lot going on with this game's photo mode, and I guarantee you'll find yourself using it quite frequently when exploring the gorgeous world of Tsushima. The fact that you can transition from gameplay to photo mode and change things around without a single load screen easily demonstrates a level of polish a lot of other games can't seem to match. On the topic of performance, the game runs at a standard 1080p on base PS4, with PS4 Pro systems having the choice of an additional higher resolution setting that roughly outputs at a dynamic 1800p, with the base 1080p setting relegated to a performance mode that slightly buffs the average frame rate. In terms of frame rate, the game runs at 30 frames per second on both the PlayStation 4 and PS4 Pro versions. There are small dips in frame rate every now and then on the base PS4 and Pro version in the higher resolution mode, with the base PS4 version performing slightly worse. The Pro version in performance mode runs the game at an almost solid consistent at 30fps, but because of that I'd still recommend going for the higher resolution mode if you've got a PS4 Pro, as the frame rate in that mode is almost exactly the same as the performance mode, but with slightly more common dips that in my opinion aren't worth sacrificing the higher resolution for. Another thing worth noting in terms of performance is that the load times in general are really quite quick for an open world console game, which is very impressive, especially for a game of this scale, with the average load times only being about 5 seconds long when using a HDD hard drive. I haven't got a spare SSD hard drive to test if the load times are even faster on the PS4 using that, but I'd imagine the difference would be negligible. It makes dying a lot less painful of an experience, due to the quick load times putting you straight back into the action in only a couple seconds. Fast travel is also quick, taking only a few moments to transport you across the map, which makes exploring the open world completing everything a lot, lot more manageable, 
and far less tedious than a lot of other open world games with longer load times. It's the first time I've ever played a game where fast travel actually feels like fast travel. To summarise, the world design and general aesthetic of the game is absolutely outstanding, with excellent use of colour to make each location on the island stand out, yet consistent. Graphically it looks phenomenal, though in some places inferior to other games on the platform, in particular when it comes to texture resolution and in-game character model detail. That being said, the game more than makes up for it with its incredible foliage and weather systems that help to obscure any negatives the graphics have and truly immerse the player in the game. The performance as well is incredibly polished and optimised for an open world game with super quick load times, a solid frame rate and relatively small file size considering the scale of the game. Overall it's a visual treat that runs incredibly well, better than almost any other game on the platform in my opinion. Jin Sakai, nephew to the great Lord Shimura, and I am no coward! <laughs> Your enemy is no match for you. But you still lack control. When you first start the game, you can choose either English or Japanese voice acting, with options for English subtitles. I played the game mostly with the English dub, but I did check out the Japanese dub during some cutscenes and both dubs are absolutely brilliant. And even though the Japanese dub adds a lot more authenticity to the dialogue, I ended up playing through the game with the English dub because as that's my native language, I could better identify the nuance and emotion in the character's voices better. Uh, one issue that must be commented on though is that the lip syncing on characters is only designed with the English dub in mind so it can be kind of disorienting to listen to the Japanese dub or any other language dub, whilst the character's mouths are moving in a different way to what they're saying. ほどなく軍勢が押し寄せるぞ。なら逃げなきゃ。on that note, the game also features several other dub languages available in the audio section in the game's menu, including French, Spanish, German, Italian, Portuguese, Russian and Polish, with additional subtitle options for all of those languages as well as Finnish, Dutch, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, UK English, Turkish, Arabic, Czech, Hungarian, Greek, and Croatian. The plethora of different dubs and subs for the game will hopefully enable more players from around the world to be able to enjoy the game without compromising the story and dialogue for them. Now, I always bring up the language option in games because localization is a tricky, yet incredibly beneficial thing and a lot of languages, like Greek and Croatian, rarely get translated in games, which means audiences that primarily speak those languages usually miss out on the story, dialogue, and even such simple things as objective descriptions for quests, which can make some games a real chore to play. So I'm glad to see such a wide coverage of language options in this game. The soundtrack for Ghost of Tsushima is absolutely incredible. Every single track perfectly elevates every scene and section that they play in, whether during the middle of a tense combat situation, or during an emotionally gripping cutscene, or even when you're riding your horse across the island of Tsushima, the soundtrack always helps to make you feel the weight of what you're doing. My favourite track in particular is the main track, The Way of a Ghost, that plays during key moments of the story as it's a really powerful track that perfectly conveys the emotional weight of Jin's journey, especially when the vocal version of the track plays during the main story. The 
The sound design is also incredible, with the game featuring a variety of different sound options including a variety of speaker layout options and even the implementation of 3D audio for better immersion. In terms of the actual in-game sound itself, it's all really good. With each sword clash, the sound of your horse galloping through a field, and the sound of Jin traipsing through snow all sounding exactly how they need to. The sound of thunder in particular is really punchy and carries a lot of weight whenever it boomed through my speakers. Some sound effects, such as the wind, also play out of the controller's speakers regularly, which is a cool addition that again helps to get the player further immersed in the game's world. Ghost of Tsushima excels in every area when it comes to the audio, whether it's the large variety of language options, the captivating soundtrack that evokes a lot of emotion as you venture through Tsushima, and finally the excellent sound design and mixing that helps to really bring the island to life. If you've got a good sound system connected to your PS4, you're in for a real auditory treat. One element to Ghost of Tsushima that's really cool is the optional Kurosawa mode, a filter that adds a film grain effect, diminishes the audio quality, limits the frame rate, and adds a monochrome colour filter to try and replicate the feeling of Akira Kurosawa's legendary samurai films. And it does that quite well, though I will admit that it does make the game a lot harder to play, due to the dodge and parry markers being a lot harder to identify and react to. So if you do plan on playing the game this way, it's probably be best to adjust your difficulty to counter it. Visually and audibly though, it really does nail what it's trying to achieve, and it's really quite commendable that Sucker Punch went to such lengths to properly implement this mode in such a faithful way. I personally found the Kurosawa mode fun, as it helps to really make each encounter a lot more cinematic and epic, though it must be said that I don't recommend playing the whole game with it on, or maybe even just waiting until a second playthrough to use it, as you really do miss out on a lot by using it. For one, the game is so colourful and detailed it's almost a crime to remove it all from the world. Likewise, the sound design and mixing in the game is absolutely outstanding, and the filter used on the audio when in Kurosawa mode really does it all to service. When it comes to the open world, despite it following the same overall tropes that other open world games have, with several different types of collectibles to collect and objectives to complete, feeling very much like an arbitrary checklist for completion, Ghost of Tsushima differs somewhat because despite similar objectives in a gameplay sense, the way you find and complete them feels very different than in other games, as it encourages exploration a lot more with birds and smoke in the overworld acting as visible markers to guide you to places where collectibles or other objectives lie. Side quests can be unlocked on the map by either stumbling on the target location, or by talking to random civilians who will tell you about them and mark them on your map. If you want the more formulaic open world experience of tracking down open world collectibles, you can always just liberate Mongol camps on the island, which when liberate will uncover a chunk of the map surrounding it as well as any open world activities or collectibles on that section of the map. Once you liberate all of the camps in an area, that area's entire map will automatically clear, revealing all the open world activities you haven't encountered yet. You can also unlock through the use of technique points upgrades to the Guiding Wind, which will allow you to set it to guide you towards various different collectibles and objective markers in the world as you get nearer to them, which can be quite helpful. Either way, Exploring the map to find stuff is both relatively easy, yet not completely brain dead. If you go for the full exploration approach towards completion, I'd highly recommend acquiring and upgrading the Traveler's Attire, as not only is it a pretty great outfit cosmetically, but the bonuses it gives are designed with completion in mind, such as uncovering more of the map as you run across the island, to causing the controller to vibrate when you're near an unmarked collectible. 
The island of Tsushima is divided into three areas, Izahara, Toyotama and finally Kamiyagata, with the latter being the smallest of the three areas. These areas are all chock full of various different side quests, collectibles and biomes to explore, each with their own trials and tribulations that must be overcome. Shinto shrines are one of the many collectibles that are featured in the game's open world. You'll find these shrines dotted across the island, with each one rewarding you with a charm on finding them. These charms are quite useful and well worth tracking down, as when equipped they provide varying degrees of beneficial buffs to Jin. All of the Shinto shrines focus on platforming and utilising traversal to access them, and they're all quite fun to complete, and give you the opportunity to look at some gorgeous vistas, and really take in the beauty of the island of Tsushima. Similar to Shinto shrines, there are also Inari shrines, dedicated to Inari, the kami of agriculture and plenty. To find these, of which there are many across the island, you must track down fox dens in the wilderness, and find the fox near it, who will lead you to the shrines if you follow them. Finding and honouring these shrines will reward Jin with more charm slots, which will definitely help you on your quest to liberate Tsushima. Plus you get the chance to pet a fox, which, let's face it, we all love doing that. There are several collectibles in the open world that also benefit the player by enhancing Jin's stats, such as the hot springs dotted around Tsushima, that increase Jin's maximum health, or the Bamboo Strike Quick Time minigames, where you have to press a set of buttons in a short time frame to increase your maximum resolve. There are also haiku challenges where you write a short poem that rewards you with a new headband, though from my experience I only wore one or two of them for a short while during my entire playthrough, as a lot of the much cooler headgear like straw hats and the Sly Cooper themed headband can only be found as secrets in the overworld. On the topic of vanity items, as mentioned, you'll find some of those dotted around the world, though they won't be marked on the map, so you'll have to set the guiding wind to point you towards them if you wish to collect them, or just find them randomly. You'll also be able to unlock new headgear and armour from side quests and through the main story. Honestly, part of the fun with the open world really is just finding new gear and customising Jin to look as cool as you want him to. Collecting the Sashimono banners dotted around the world and in Mongol camps will also unlock new saddles for your horse, which is good for ensuring that your loyal steed looks just as cool as you. Uh, there are also singing crickets that can be found in cemeteries across the island which reward you with new melodies that you can play on your flute. Aside from the collectibles that benefit Jin on a gameplay level, there are also other collectibles such as written records that contain personal accounts, poems and messages from people across Tsushima, which is a nice way of fleshing out the world further and showing different sides of the conflict not fully explored during the game's main story. Collecting the records doesn't benefit Jin in any mechanical way, and you don't need to collect them all for full trophy completion, but for those players that love the story in the world of Tsushima, they'll definitely be worth collecting. Suffice to say, there is plenty to see and do on the island of Tsushima, with a Platinum Trophy run usually taking around 40-60 to 60 hours to complete, depending on both your skill level and what difficulty you decided to play on. For those of you who don't particularly feel up for full trophy completion, don't fret. You're not forced to complete any of the side content or collectibles to progress with the story, which is good, as the game is balanced in the sense that you could probably clear the game without too much trouble, if you only focused on finishing the story, though you would miss out on some useful stat buffs and abilities in your, if you do. There's a lot to enjoy in the open world though, so I'd highly recommend doing as much as you feel like doing, and take a break by progressing with the main story for a bit, if the grind of clearing each area's content starts to get to you. In conclusion, Ghost of Tsushima is a damn near perfect swan song for the PlayStation 4 generation, and yet another impressive single-player experience to add to the console's catalogue of incredible first-party exclusives. Sucker Punch have managed to create a game that for all intents and purposes perfects the open world formula. The island of Tsushima is an incredible location to explore and each area within is gorgeous and beautiful to behold, thanks to the great artistic design and effort put into making each area stand out, yet still fit in overall. The content of the open world is also fun to discover and complete, 
Though admittedly some of the objectives in the world can tend to drag after a while, in particular when the novelty of the theming starts to wear off, though it must be said that it at least retained my interest a lot more than other open world games on that front. The audio in the game is also superb in every aspect, with the various language options, excellent sound design and mixing, as well as an emotionally captivating soundtrack, all helping to boost the player's immersion in the game's world, though it's definitely a shame that the lip-syncing of the characters only matches up with the English dub of the game. The story, whilst formulaic and for the most part heavily inspired and iterative of samurai movies, is still brilliantly told and though it takes a while for the story to really get going, the second half of the main story is quite engrossing and emotionally captivating, with incredibly powerful moments due to the excellent cinematography and likeable characters. The gameplay mixes stealth and action perfectly, with every mechanic working well and making you feel at times like a complete badass. Whether you decide to sneak around encampments picking enemies off one by one, or if you charge head on into a group with sword in hand, you almost have always have fun with the game's combat. If you hadn't already guessed, I absolutely enjoyed almost every minute with Ghost of Tsushima, and whilst not everything about the game is perfect, it's still a tightly made, lengthy and satisfying experience that is in my opinion more than worth the full price. It's one of the few games where I'm not only satisfied after paying full price for it, I'm more than satisfied after paying full price for the deluxe edition of it, which usually doesn't happen. In my opinion, Ghost of Tsushima is definitely in the running to be my personal game of the year, and I'm sure it will be for others as well. It's a game with few errors and the ones it does make aren't major, and as such, I highly recommend it for anyone with a PS4, or whom plans on getting a PS5 because I'm sure it will receive some extra enhancements on the next gen platform that will clean up a lot of the rougher edges the game does have. It's a beautiful game and perfectly concludes Sony's excellent array of AAA single player experiences on PlayStation 4, ready to make way for the next generation of experiences that hopefully will be just as good or greater than what they have published this generation. It will also be interesting to see just what Sucker Punch Studios do next as they've had a successful generation beginning with Infamous Second Son and ending with Ghost of Tsushima, so hopefully that will carry on with their next project, whatever it may be. That's all the time we have in this video. I hope I managed to express my feelings for Ghost of Tsushima cohesively and succinctly. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe to support the channel. It really helps me out. Likewise, comment below with your thoughts on the video, as well as your thoughts on Ghost of Tsushima if you've played it. I'm interested in knowing what you all think. Until next time though, this is Kingdom H, signing off.